click start. And we are now live. So welcome everyone to another Dental Shadows virtual shadowing session. Um, today we're joined by Dr. Fava, who is a periodontist. Um, Dr. Fava, whenever you're ready, you can go ahead and take it away. All right. Well, uh, thank you to the Dental Shadowers team. Uh, and I hope that, you know, this can generate some good discussion. I know that you guys kind of wait towards the end, but the reality is, uh, Ibrahim Krupa, if, if you guys are following the chat and there's things that come up during the actual presentation, so to speak, then um, mm -hmm. then please, by all means, I, I, I don't mind stopping and, and discussing. Uh, I, I'd prefer that this be less of a frontal lecture and more of a conversation because the reality is um, uh, my life is a very, very busy one. And this is something that I think is important. Important, but I didn't uh, fabricate a whole new presentation for this specifically. So in that way, um, what I have is something that uh, just to give you kind of an idea of what I'm doing. But the truth is, and I mean this with respect, some of this dentistry is just going to not really make any sense to because there's just there's there's not enough of an underpinning and experience yet on on your guys' behalf, which is completely totally appropriate. But it's kind of fun to see what's happening quote unquote, on the other side, you know? So um, this is part, this is to give you guys an idea. I'm, I'm somebody who I lecture to other dentists and uh, in doing so I make up, you can see this is a, um, uh, this is a uh, lecture that I gave in a, uh, to an ITI study club in Colorado on uh, October 19, 2019. So the cool part is if this is something that you're passionate about and teaching is a, is a thing, you can bring that around the world. So I've actually gotten to lecture really throughout the entire country. Um, and while I have not lectured, uh, I can network. And that is a really fun part of if you want to be involved like that, dentistry gives you the opportunity to do that. So this is a this was a group I was talking to. I'm a periodontist. So periodontist means that we focus more on the gums, more on the bone, more on like the placement of implant type stuff. So we focus a lot kind of on the foundation as opposed to say like the house, which would be like the crowns and stuff like that. So we do a lot of stuff that people don't see. We do some stuff that people see, of course, but the, uh, the reality is uh, I was lecturing in this group to uh, a group of prosthodontists. Prosthodontists are somebody who periodontists really like to work with because prosthodontists are specialists in the crown and bridge and the reconstructive part in terms of the restorative. Uh, nowadays, it's starting to change where they're starting to learn implants. I'm just going to go out and say a probably relatively unpopular opinion but I don't think that everybody should be placing implants. That's not to serve my own business because my own business stands on its own and I'm very competitive with my, within my region. And so my business is a very strong one and I'm not worried about what other people are doing. What I'm more concerned about is as a periodontist who specializes in implants, my offices do a lot of implants. I have two practices and between the two practices, we do over a thousand implants a year. And so I see a lot of other implants that are problems. And so implantology is an important part of dentistry. It's an, a very important part of periodontics. But um, the unfortunate thing is it's gotten extremely popular and now everybody's getting involved with it. And it's something that I really think requires a lot more education and skill than what you necessarily are going to get from any market driven education system. So there's a lot of companies out there that want to sell you their implant. So they will teach you how to place implants, so to speak. Those programs are, you know, weekend courses. Um, they are not similar to what it requires to understand all the biology around it. There's a lot more to it. And so in that way, I just want to give a little word of caution you can do anything you want in dentistry. I just think that it's really important to get the education because patients are now recognizing that they want a certain level of care. And if you can't provide that level of care, you shouldn't really be playing in that, in that field. So for instance, you could be super expert with veneers per se, 
but not know a single thing about soft tissue grafting. And that's completely and totally normal and completely and totally appropriate. Where it becomes problematic and where I see a lot of the issues that I get as these second opinions in these fixer upper cases is where people were playing across where they're, where they're not. So for instance, me in my world, I do not prep any teeth, period. I don't treat any cavities. I don't make crowns. The only thing that I do is I do crown lengthening, which makes it so that a tooth that doesn't have enough, what we call feral effect, which is basically the ability for the crown to grab onto the tooth. I make it so that you can gain more tooth structure to grab onto. So you could make a well-fitting, well-retaining crown. Sometimes I prep that tooth because I may remove a root or I may have to remove a height of contour to make it so that your ability to prepare it and to make an impression and then to make a crown on that is better. So I'll play with that. But the point is, I don't do those things. If a patient comes to me and they're a new patient, they say, hey, you know, I I also want these crowns. Can you do this? I just say, no, I can't, but I can get you with the team member who can. And I think that that is a great way to practice no matter what style of practice you are, even in general dentistry, where you're doing definitely a little bit of everything, but, you know, doing a second molar endo as a general dentist, unless you're doing a lot of endodontics and you're taking a lot of continuing education and you're gaining a lot of experience, you just cannot do it at the level of someone who does eight endos a day, four days a week. You just can't. And I think it's really important that we just recognize that because just like that endodontist who could do that endo with their eyes closed, that maybe a GP can't do. I'll tell you what that endodontist can't do. They can't prep a full arch of teeth. They can't prep maybe even a single tooth anymore, to be honest with you. And it's not that any one is better than the other. It's just that multidisciplinary care really provides a really high level. And so because that's a really big, a really big passion of mine. This is just a little presentation that I'm just sharing with you. So you have an idea of, you know, this is what my professional looks like before COVID. I used to go around and lecture. And then after COVID, I, I've only, I've only spoken to one large group since COVID. Uh, I was the first one was on a plane since COVID. It was in, it was in uh, the end of July, early August uh, that I went down to speak to the American college of profs down in Florida. And I'll share a little bit of that of, of that presentation too. So let me just give you guys a little a little idea. I'm from Long Island originally. So Ibrahim, I know you're in you're in Northern Jersey, so you have family also in, in, in New York. So I'm from Long Island originally. Um, and then from Long Island, I went to college, which is a liberal arts school. I liked a liberal arts school because it taught me how to learn, taught me how to think. And I think that that's probably the most important thing you can do as a professional is learn how to think, learn how you learn, learn how you need to think, learn how you can get better and better at that because that is ultimately your most important skill. I no longer can do the problems that I could solve when I was in, uh, when I was in school. So for instance, um, I was lucky enough in school to do well. So I was in like AP classes before I went to college, right? I guarantee you, if I ran into any of my AP physics or AP calculus courses right now, and uh, if I have a relatively newborn, I have a two month old, when she is taking these courses and she comes to me for help, I'm going to have to look on YouTube to figure out how to do it. And I used to do well at it and I can't do it anymore. And so the reason I'm talking about this is because the skill set of learning how to learn is much more important than what actually you may have in rote memory. Now, some people are really gifted. I'm sure there's a lot of you on here who are really, really gifted students who may still be able to do calculus when they're into dental school and they can still do it because they remember it and they did it so well. And that's what it is. And that's great. That is, that is great. But If you go for that, the sense of just like the rote memorization without the ability to think and apply, 
the reality is that you become much more pigeonholed and you become much less valuable to your team, to your patients, to the people who you're around, because your ability to interact with a group is really, really important. And really what that requires is more about a knowledge of self and a knowledge of how to learn and take in new information from new, constantly new experiences and be able to assimilate them into your life in a cohesive way so you can have a practice that runs with an ethic with a value system that run you right down how you do your business and that you can continue moving forward. This is a simple thing to say, a constant challenge to do, but it is the key to how anybody in dentistry, in my my purview, becomes successful. So I started out on Long Island, went to a school where I could learn how to learn. I learned how to learn. I learned how to write. That's really what what, what I did there. And then uh, from there, this is, this is, for those of you who don't know what Long Island looks like, this is literally uh, eight minutes from my house. Um, and now I live in Philadelphia, so I don't get to be near water anymore. But that was me as a little kid and more of us. And my sister is a uh, psychologist. She works on Long Island. She is a mile and a half from my parents. <laughs> and my grandmother lives across the street from my parents. And my other grandmother, unfortunately, just passed away, but she was 15 minutes away and the rest of my family is all within 15 minutes of there. So a very tight knit family, but I uh, ultimately went to Penn Medicine or Penn Dental Medicine and I really liked Penn. Penn is a very expensive school. It's a school that nowadays the reality is inside the dental world. The dental world is very competitive and I do not want to cast a cynical shadow, but because the dental world is very competitive, you start to think to yourself, if you don't have parents who can help you with this tuition, you don't know if this tuition is a thing that you want to really be going after. And I hate to say that because I can't tell you how much pen set me up for my success, but I had help, so I didn't have to pay for the entire thing. After I went to there, I went to UConn. Well, actually, this this is now what they've made their new clinic in. When I was there, the clinic looked the way on the left, and now it looks like this. So all those tuition dollars definitely got somewhere. It's a very cynical thing to say. The truth is, listen, these schools have huge endowments, but it costs what it costs to go to these schools. From there, I went to UConn for my specialty. The reason I went to UConn was twofold. One, the program director that was there was supposed to be superb. And that was very, very important to me. Two, I didn't have to pay for school. UConn is one of the few programs that have a tuition that you don't really pay. And they give you a small stipend every month. 11000 or I think it's like $1,000 a month. I think it's like a thousand dollars a month. Maybe it's thirteen thousand dollars a year or eleven thousand dollars a year. I don't know. I don't remember. The point is, I lived off of it, and you were able to do that at UConn. Um, and I had the government loans, which allowed me to defer so that the the interest continued to accrue. But I had no credit history. I had nothing against my credit that I wasn't paying my loan yet. That's one of the nice things about those of you who are going to be getting loans for school. It's one of the nice things about a government loan. The bad thing about a government loan is this interest rate is atrocious. My interest rate, even after the, the, the forgiveness that they give you for being on auto pay and all like, you know, three years of on-time payments and blah, 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 it's still at 6.55%, which in today's market is not even remotely competitive. Not, not even close. I can consolidate it for probably 2% or 3%. But the reality is the reason why I haven't, despite the fact that I have zero financial hardship, is the fact that if I ever needed to defer because I wanted to put money into the business, and if I ever had a tough time, like, hey, remember when COVID happened? Well, dental office is shut down for three months. So depending on how you were prepared, There were people who had really, really hard times. I thankfully didn't, but you never know when that's going to happen. And if you are a business owner, you are always the last to be paid. You may be paid the most, 
but you also are the last to be paid. So you may not be paid at all. And so it's something that you have to understand your responsibility as a business owner is to your team members and to the people who you care for. And they come first. And that's the reality of being a leader. A leader is the person who always eats last. That's how it goes. It's a hard way to go about things for sure, but it's very, very rewarding. And when I went to UConn, it enabled me to come out and go into a practice where I practice uh, first, my practice on the left. Bob Levine is, uh, he was my partner. He's now an associate. He works for me. And we transitioned from him owning the practice to me owning the practice. And then on the right, you see me just by myself because I opened up a second office. So the cool part about dentistry is dentistry allows you to be entrepreneurial. That's a very, very cool part of dentistry. One of the things that's bad about that is you're going to see people in dental school who are just about money. And that is awful. They give all the rest of us a really bad name. They only know how to think from the money perspective. And thus, they're also the people who then to say like, oh, they take a weekend course and they start doing this. They take a weekend course, they start doing that. And they don't really have the type of chops and education and experience and knowledge base required, but they do it because it provides revenue. And so you're going to see this in dental school and you're going to see because you're going from Many of you are going from like, you know, the high school, college into dental school stuff. And one of the things that you're going to start to see is you're going to see people who are professionals. When you see professionals, you're going to see people who are much further down the line than you. And you're going to see what their lifestyle is like. Because as I said, I was living on $13,000 a year, right? When I was in residency, that's what I lived off of. And then you find out there are people who are spending that amount, my yearly amount, per month to live. And obviously it's a huge difference and people can get caught up in it. But I really suggest to you that you don't get caught up in it and that you really focus on just trying to hone your craft. The nice thing about this is that you can be entrepreneurial, you can build a business, you can build a lifestyle, you can build a whole bunch of stuff, but none of that matters if you can't do the right thing by people. And if you can't do the right thing by the team members that are part of your, your organization and the patients you're caring for, all of this is for naught. And all you become is somebody who trusts me because I see it. All they are are people who unfortunately have good salaries, but they live in a month to month basis like everybody else on the planet. And it's a real shame to take something like that, which is really a privilege to be able to afford yourself that ability. And that's how they squander it, because it just seems that those people who are doing that are always in that scenario. So I think it's important that you focus in what I took away from my education was that you're constantly learning. There's always more to do. Um, I want you guys to know that I learn on a daily basis. I actually study, if you could imagine that, I've been practicing already for 10 years, and I still study on a near daily basis. Now, studying is very different because I don't have to apply for anything. I don't need any exams. I don't need any of that type of stuff. I'm studying because I want to get better and because I, I genuinely just want to improve. And I know that my skill set, while significant, is not fully complete and not fully honed. And I want to see how far I can get. And so the cool part about dentistry is this allows you to do that. So I've learned a lot as a periodontist. I've learned a lot as a business owner. I've learned a lot as being a coach. I've learned a lot as being an entrepreneur. I've learned a lot about being a family man. All of these things are things that I have received literal education for. I've gone for coaching for every single one of those things that you heard me say. I've received coaching for it. I've spent hundreds of hours and tens of thousands of dollars on coaching for those things because these are things that you can use to improve yourself. And it's very, very cool that dentistry allows you to do that. Unlike 
what I was going to do when I went to, when I went to my undergrad, I was going to go to medical school. And if I worked in medical school, if I went to medical school, I was going to end up working in a hospital where I really wouldn't have the type of agency that I have. You know, I mean, I have an awful work week. I work about 70 hours a week. Um, so I'm a very, very busy person and it's honestly very punishing and I can't hold it forever. But while I've been busy with these two businesses, it's been a necessary thing. But the good news is those 70 hours are my 70 hours. I decided that. No one decided it for me. And that type of autonomy is both awesome and awful because at one part, you can push yourself as hard as you can. And on the other part, you can push yourself as hard as you can. So you don't, you have to be able to balance yourself. But it's cool that you have the ability to make your own thing. Before I had two offices, I used to work four days a week. And on my fifth day, I would spend some time doing administrative stuff. I would spend some time doing my lecturing. I would spend some time during the summer months. I just actually would take that Friday off. So it was quite cool. At the time, I didn't have a family. So it wasn't, it wasn't something that I was taking advantage of in that way. And I will begin to get there again so that I can take advantage of it with my family. So it's a cool thing that you can generate a business that provides for you a livelihood that allows you to make a work week. My former partner, the guy that you see there on the left side of the screen, he works two days a week now. He works two days a week and he makes still a very good living. He doesn't need to make a living anymore because he's already seen himself through and he made the right decisions in his life, lived beneath his means, didn't go chasing all that stuff and just focused on doing the best he could in his practice. And guess what? The financial benefit of that followed, right? So he did just fine. But the cool thing is here's a guy now who's in his mid sixties, able to take care of his grandkids three days a week. He works two days a week. He's totally off for two days a week. It's a good gig. It's a good gig. You can't beat that with a stick. And so it's nice that that's a, that that's a thing. However, let me be very, very clear. That is not just guaranteed to everybody. That's earned. You earn that. That took years, decades of Bob's effort to get himself to that point. It took decades worth of effort to build a practice and a skill set that could help to build that practice, that could build enough value in the community that would allow him to do stuff like that. So it's a cool profession in that way because you can make it whatever you want. You know, you can make it so that your practice is a very big, prominent practice. You can make it so that it's a more mom and pop thing where you have more of a more of a smaller sized and more of a, hey, I'm open these days a week type of thing. And you could have a more balanced lifestyle. I currently right now don't have a balanced lifestyle. I have a work like mad lifestyle. That's the reality. But Bob, my, my former partner, my associate now, on the other hand, he has a cool, he's with his grandkids three days a week doing childcare. He does lecturing like, like I do. And he works two days a week. And so it's all, it's all, it's all good. Yeah. I'll take, thank you. Thanks. Wibu. So, so this is, this is what dentistry can be if you really want to make something of it for yourself. And in that way, it's very, very cool. And also what's cool is you can make things work for you in terms of how your time looks and what have you. So I work early in the morning. Um, but you don't have to, you can work later in the evening. You could take off Wednesdays. You could be closed Mondays. You could, you know, you could do it. However, you could be off every other Monday, you stuff like that. So that's the cool part about your business. However, there's one thing to say about thing when it, when it comes to that, you have to be able to care for the people who are in your organization that if you don't take anything else away from this lecture, I would hope you take away two things. One, you have to always continually learn. You have to. Two, you have to take care of people. This is a human-based capital. There's a reason why dentists are still not going to be and probably never will be replaced by robots because there is still a human component. There is still a human capital to this. 
And as long as we as a community continue to allow that to be the way that it is, we'll always be relevant that way. And so you don't have to worry about people coming in, taking your job and stuff like that. It just won't be that way. It just won't. But you have to be able to care for people. So that's those are me, you know, kind of being on the soapbox. Uh, that's that's we just got married. I, I live in Philadelphia now. So I, I bought that practice in Philadelphia. We got married at the Barnes, a cool place in 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 Philadelphia. Um, and so we had a real rip roaring party. It was a lot of fun and it was probably the, uh, the best day of my life. So we really had a great time. And, uh, this, the reason why this was in there in this lecture was because this is also the first time my wife ever came to a lecture because we went out to Colorado. We stayed with some friends, the people who I happened to be speaking for, they happen to be a husband, wife. He's a prosthodontist. She's a periodontist. They've got this big study club. I went and spoke and then I stayed at their house with my wife and we stayed with their, their, their kids. And we stayed there for three days and we got to see the area in Colorado. We got to eat with, with them at their home. We got to go out to dinner out and about. And it's very cool. It's very, very colorful. These are the things you can do in dentistry. It's really very cool. And in that way, I have friends literally all over the world. I have places to stay in Arizona, in Australia, in South Africa, in Brazil. I have people who I could literally say I could just go and stay at their house. And they, likewise, can come stay at mine. And it's really quite cool that you can develop this network. The other cool thing about that network is it opens your eyes to the world and it opens your eyes to what you're doing in your practice because you don't need to be alone on your little island in your practice, just doing your own thing. You can see what other people are doing. You can learn from them. And so this is a really, really wonderful thing. And that's one of the cool things that I really like about dentistry is you can do this. So I had this up here because I just wanted to, you know, introduce everybody to my wife who's sitting there in the room for the first time ever to see me speak. Um, and so that was, that was there. This I spoke earlier. I said this is an ITI lecture. The ITI is a pro, is a group that I very very highly recommend that you get involved with, no matter what you're going to be involved with in terms of what discipline. So if you're going to be a GP, you're going to be pros, going to be perio, going to be oral surgery, even going to be endo. But I can see why endo may not. This may not fit. This ITI stands for International Team of Implant for Implantology. This is the premier implant-based organization in dentistry, full stop. This is where some of the most important research on implants comes out. I happen to be a fellow of this organization. Um, I have lectured for this organization at a national level, not international level. And um, what we missed, unfortunately, was there was going to be the World Symposium in Singapore, May 14 to 16, 2020. Uh, so obviously no one was flying, especially not to that part of the world, but no one was flying. And this unfortunately got canceled. What was very cool is they instead did this in a virtual way, which it's very hard to explain it to you. But the idea was the lecturers gave the lectures live. They actually did travel. They gave the lectures live. And then they all sat together on a couch and they discussed it and they discussed from Q&A coming from people watching all over the world. So we had like 6,400 people watching and we would all type in questions. It was very cool. What they did is they broke it down into six different patients and each patient had three different lecturers on it and then the conversation about it at the end. So it talked about a specific problem. And then talking with three different people about how they kind of would go about it, what the evidence is, what their approach is. And then the three of them then talk about it in a, in a moderated fashion. Very, very cool. So even when we couldn't go meet, but I got to say, how cool would it be to have a reason, a tax write-off reason to go to Singapore? So my wife and I were going to go. We're going to go down. We were discussing whether or not we're going to go to Australia because I have friends down there that I wanted to I wanted to visit with, or we're going to go to New Zealand or something like that because you know it's on the other side of the world, right? So how often are you going to go there? But so how cool is that? That these are things that you can do, um, you know. And guess what? One of the cool things is not that I was lecturing there. I was not. I was not lecturing there. But if you lecture there, guess what? You go for free. 
that's pretty cool. That's a, that's a cool thing. You know, it's not to be sneezed at because a trip to Singapore is expensive. <laughs> There's no way around that. Um, but so anyway, I'll just go, you don't need to talk about any of this. You don't have folks on any of this. Um, this was the video the of promotional video for it. So big. To give you an idea all the ITI the colleagues, quality. all the speakers, I think this is really a tremendous event. Together. So they have a surgical kind of side and a restorative kind of side run by some of the best people in the world. Friends of mine, I can, I'm lucky to say that's a very, very cool place to develop a network. So for those of you who end up in the Philadelphia region, I have an ITI study club. So something you can join and then you participate in and you just get to meet good people and you get to learn what the evidence-based style of dentistry is available today so very uh very cool so you don't need to know about any of this so you don't need to know any of that let's just let's skip past there to give you an idea of what kind of fun so to speak that this also happens is i've never played tennis before um and uh this this was a little video that one of our friends made because we made a round robin tour after this is during a, this is a few of the lectures that, um, that we spoke in the, the North American Congress. And so we're just playing some tennis and it was a ton of fun. So this is like, you know, it's a good way to make one of your friends and stuff like that. But you can see these guys are from all over the place. And these people are from, uh, you are from Brazil, you are from, these, are, these guys haven't all been from North America, but there's an Australian there, a Spaniard there, a Brazilian there, a Dutchman right here, that's an Australian, and so, this is, this is how, you know, we just have to end up having a fun, alongside of us, after we all go and learn. So, it's just a really good, really good group of people, I it's fun loving. It's friendly. It's uh, I think it's really I think it's really a, a great institution and it's a great way for me to kind of prove to you guys, hey, learning can be a really enriching part of your life because it's not just all this clinical stuff. It's also making these friends. It's making this network. These are people who you can depend on. So when you have hard cases that you might be questioning how you're going to go about it, you have people to reach out to. People who care, people who know, people who you trust, people who know you, and people who can really talk to you. So what I'll show you, what I'll show you now is I'll show you a little bit of, of what I do on a daily basis. So one of the cool things is in dentistry is the digital workflow has become very, very common. You don't start out doing it. You have to start learning the analog stuff. And the reason for that is because you have to develop hand skill. You have to develop basic knowledge. You need basic knowledge. The digital workflow is just a way to effectively digitize the analog workflow. So you guys will all learn how to wax up teeth. And then you come to find out that you can also just digitally bang, have a tooth, and you could alter its dimensions quite easily. But the point is that you first need to learn how to do that before you can then just jump into the digital space. But so 
The way that I picture myself in my practice is I practice as a periodontist doing a lot of comprehensive complex cases. So a lot of the stuff that I do is while I still do treat like single implants and single gum grafts and stuff like that, I do a lot of things where I'm managing people's full mouth or one full arch at a time. So in this, I was using the, the, here is this agenda for this, for this lecture that I was giving. And what I was going to show is I was going to show three different cases and I was going to talk about some things about it. So restorative space is a concept that when you need to fit a tooth, you start. So um, let's just look at, let's just look at this. This is a pretty classic scenario. Unfortunately, someone comes in, you can see this denture is old, right? I mean, you can see the staining at the margins of all the teeth, just because that's where the acrylic of the denture and the acrylic of the teeth, there's a little bit of a gap. So now, you know, biofilm has gotten underneath there. It stains over time. You can't clean it because it's underneath the acrylic. You can't get in. It's in between the tooth and the acrylic, that little micro, that little micro space. But you can see that. And you can also see, unfortunately, this poor patient's missing the lower teeth, basically, right? So does patient get a new upper denture if they, if finances dictate that they can't do implants in the upper, but on the bottom, let me just bring everyone up to speed on this a little bit. If you have someone who has to redo their entire mouth and they only have the type of finances or they're only interested in implants in the quote unquote, I don't want to say bare minimum, but in the, in the least involved scenario, you need to use it in the lower jaw. Removable prosthetics in the lower jaw, as you will find out in dental school, are the hardest to deal with. The reason is the top jaw has the palate and the palate is full of firm, dense connective tissues that don't move. So when you put a denture up there, you have a nice base to work on. So you can get some suction and you can get something that works, generally speaking. But on the bottom arch, you have the tongue, the floor of the mouth underneath that. You have the masseter muscles pulling off on the side. And you can see here in this photo, are you able to see my mouse? Okay. Yes, we can see it. You can see here, you see this pull of these, you can see these, these muscle fibers. You can see these. And this is just me from pulling the cheek. But you see how much higher they insert on the, on the lower jaw. You also have them over here behind underneath the tongue. Now, look at this. This is not the tongue itself. This is the floor of the mouth that has now increased in space to occupy this space. So if this patient closes, swallows, they are able to clear this area. They need to create a suction. So the tongue literally expands to take that space. But if you go to put a denture in here, all these things moving around, they move the denture around the lower. So the lower is really, really hard for patients to deal with. So you always want to be trying to think about the bottom jaw as doing something in the way of what we call fixed or with a quote unquote locator, something that has something to help retention because retention in the lower jaw is very, very hard, much harder than the upper jaw. All right. So one of the things that we're ta I was talking about in this lecture is I was talking about the amounts of space that we have. And you can see between the green line and the red line that there's a significant difference in the amount of space there. And even though you guys are not yet in dental school, you can appreciate the fact that the green line is bigger than the red line. And what this means is that we have more space in the back and less space in the front. So what this means is if we're going to transition to implants, we need to know how much space we need. Are we going to work with the red space or the green space? I'm going to tell you that it just it needs to be the green space because that's not the point of our lecture today. So you can also see that because she's missing her back teeth, look what's happened to the denture. She's made a hole. Can you see the hole right there? 
Um, so let's move forward. So I don't have her face on uh, on Facebook here. So along with so here we go with just a new upper denture. So I worked with a prosthodontist. They did a new upper denture, and you can see what a big difference just from that alone, right? But now we're going to keep that same that line that plane of occlusion. We're going to go across. What we're going to do is we're going to try to figure out what the ideal space is. So here are four types of implant restorations. You have a fixed restoration, a hybrid restoration, a bar retained restoration, and an overdenture restoration. And you can appreciate that in each one of these, there is a different amount of space from the neck of the tooth to the model. See here and here, here and here, here and here. You see it's different in each one. Now, there's no reason for us to go through what these numbers mean and why. But what's important to take away from this is that they're all different. They all require a different amount. And so when it comes to implant dentistry, one of the biggest mistakes that people make is they don't appreciate the amount of space required for a given restoration. So what happens is they'll place implants and they're going to cause problems. So let's look at what some of these problems can be. So, well, let's look at the good ones first. So here's an ideal scenario where that's an implant replacing a single premolar. And you can see to you guys, it may not really mean that much, but trust me when I tell you that when the rest of the dental community looks at this, they go, oh yeah, that's some nice tissue. That emergence from that implant really replicates what it looks like from the tooth. And now we know that we have a nice emergence. And so you guys might appreciate when you look at that, it may not be a hundred percent that make all this much sense, but you can appreciate that the curves on this they follow kind of a biologic line. They, they work is what I'm trying to say, right? So this ends up being very aesthetic. And this is something that when I took that tooth out and placed that implant, I placed, I made a custom healing cap to capture those tissues so that when the restorative doctor was going to be able to go work and make the impression to make the crown, we already had the tissues beautifully sculpted because I already did all the hard and soft tissue grafting with the implant placement to make it so that everything looked beautiful. Then with these full arch cases, you can see here, we have a white tooth, a pink part of the restoration, and then you can see the emergence of these, what we call abutments, or I'm sorry, what we call temporary, we call copings, these copings that go to sit into the implant, right? And so, so, this is also something where we have enough space so that everything is following a biological, a biological scenario. Now, here is the non-ideal space. You can see here, look at this crown. You see how different this crown is from the one that I showed you before? In particular, what you're seeing is look at the distinction from where the implant hooks up to the crown versus where the crown ends. This dimension that we're looking at that curve there is very, very bad in dentistry. You never want that curve in implant dentistry. That curve means that it's non-cleansable. That means that no one can you, can, you can brush that tooth all you like. You're never going to brush in where the red line is because that's sitting up against the gum. And this patient, just to give you an idea of why I tell you to take caution and to get a lot of education, that is a referral of mine's sister. That implant was placed by a referral, by, uh, by another surgeon, restored by this referral, and that's somebody's, that's their sister. That implant came out in my hand like that. And this has, you can see on that implant, you can see kind of like, it's not all gray, you see some white schmutzy stuff. That's calculus and plaque all the way up to the top of the implant. This destroyed all the bone around this implant. So I had to do a very significant and challenging vertical grafting procedure in order to gain the bone back to place another implant to put another tooth on there. So here's a snare that was this is totally avoidable. This implant did not need to be placed like that. And then it definitely did not need to be restored like that. And this 
is the problems that we see when we don't know all of the aspects of ideal restorative space. So here's another one. We won't go into it because it's a little more subtle and you'd appreciate it more in five years. <laughs> so here's another one where we see a full arch and you see when you take off this restoration, what's underneath this restoration? That's food for the winter. This person has just been packing food for as long as they can because it's uncleansable. The reason for this is when this prosthesis was made, the what we call the intaglio surface or the area that touches the gums, that area is concave just like that crown that I showed you was. So you can't clean it. So whenever this person eats, whenever they clean, they clean here. They clean the teeth. They clean this part of the gum. They never clean here. And this is where the implant is. That's where the biological interface is. Because guess what? If this up here was as dirty as this, it's gross, but it doesn't create any biological issues because this is just plastic. This is not going to get a cavity. It's not going to get gum disease. These implants all have gum disease because you can't clean this area. You see the transition of the white prosthetic tooth, the pink prosthetic gum, and then her own natural gingiva, right? Can everybody kind of see that? So yeah, Krupa, I, I'm, I'm looking at you basically because <laughs> you're the only yeah. one to be able to say anything. But as long as you're seeing that, this is a disfigurement. This is disfigurement. This would be the equivalent of, you know, making, being a plastic surgeon or some sort of a, a dermatologist, not paying attention, putting a filler into a vessel occluding that vessel and they have necrosis on their face and they get a big scar. That's like the equivalent of this. So luckily, luckily, because this is something that I'm well versed in, I look at this and said, this is not a surgical problem. Although it started as, a, as sort of as a communication problem. This means that the team that was working were not talking these implants are in the position not for the hybrid that you see on the left. They're in position for the crown and bridge or the fixed. So this gets changed by changing the dental restoration. But here's something that is very important for the group to know. This now comes into the place of how you manage people. Because remember, we're talking right now, we've been talking a lot about teeth talking about implants, talking about problems, talking about stuff like that. But all of the teeth that you're ever going to treat are attached to a person. And you got to remember that you're treating a person, not a tooth, not a, not a dental arch, not a mouth. So this person spent significant amount of money to get to where you see on the left. And you guys don't understand this yet because it's not what you're in, but it takes almost the same amount of money to provide the restoration on the right side, even though the surgery is already done. So if you put yourself in this patient's position, imagine you spend 25 or $30,000 and you look like the left. And then you go and you see somebody because you're so upset and they don't know how to fix it and you want to fix it, and the person who's going to fix it tells you it's going to be twenty-five dollars or $30,000 again. And the reason why I bring up the money is not because of the fact that it's important, because it's not. What's important is the fact that this person has lost total and complete trust in dentistry. It's bad for every single one of us on this call. Because now they've gone and put so much of their time, their trust, their money into a group to do something. And it was an absolute failure. And now someone's going to ask them for basically the same thing that they had before. And they've got to go through this. So now this woman, very, very nice woman, she goes by, her nickname is Zippy. Zippy goes through 
And now she's very, very happy, right? She's very happy that her restoration was like this. But I'll tell you what she's not happy about. She's not happy about having to do it twice. And it takes more skill on the second time for the team to be able to develop the type of relationship with that patient and to then be able to have the skill, the wherewithal, the communication, the ability to actually then provide that restoration in order to make this person whole again. And you got to remember, you know, you don't want to be doing this to people because the best way to practice is just by doing what you would do in your own mouth. And so you wouldn't on the left, that group, apparently they weren't talking to each other. So, you know, I don't know, I don't know what the exact analogy would be, but what I know that if I had to have, if I had to have people working in my house and one was a plumber and one was an electrician, the reason why I have a general contractor is because you want to make sure that those two are talking because the last thing you want to do is you start running your wires to the wall and then realize, oh no, we have a plumbing problem. We got to rip the wall out again. Well, that's not helpful because I just paid to get the freaking wall done with the wires and now we got to run pipes through it. Now we got to take it down and redo it again. So that's the way that I kind of see it. And so if you operate in a little bubble, and not with a good, strong team. When I say team, I don't just mean your own office. I mean the dental professionals that you work with, you end up with results on the left. Now, I've said I did no surgery with this patient. I really did no treatment. I did no treatment with this patient. But how we got to the right was me being able to say, hey, listen, Dr. Randell, one of my, one of my very close friends, he's a prosthodontist. I said, listen, these implants are all healthy. And the amount of space that you have is really for crown and bridge. And you can go with this and we can, and we can do this. And if you need anything from me, I can do some soft tissue grafting. If you need in order to make some pontic sites and blah, 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 stuff you guys don't need to worry about yet. But the point is that left picture, that's a really hard day in your practice. If that's what you deliver to somebody, that's a bad day. And that's the type of thing that you get sued for and you deserve it. That's really the reality. When you do that, you deserve it. And so it's something that you really need to be aware of that inside of dentistry, there's still going to be a lot of general dentistry to be done, but the problems from years, decades of previous dentists that didn't have the type of technology, didn't have the type of abilities to treat people the way you do, the, the problems are getting a little more complex. And so you need to have the ability to solve these problems. And the last thing you want to do is have your solution look like the left and not like the right. Because when you do that, those things are practice killers. And for, for good reason, for, for good reason. But what I can tell you is the left really is completely and totally avoidable. It's completely and totally avoidable. It requires education. It requires a multidisciplinary approach with good team members, and it requires communication with your with your patient, so you can say what you need to do and why it needs to be what it needs to be. That's how you avoid this stuff in general. So this um, is Dr. Fava. I'm sorry to yeah. interrupt. I just wanted to let you know it's around seven now. So if you want to maybe just wrap up this last case, and we can get to questions, if that's okay with you. This this actually. This actually is a totally fine place for for me to stop. I, I I'm totally okay. I'm totally good. If we have especially if we have questions to go to, let's let's do okay. any questions. Okay, sounds good. Yeah, I think Ibrahim said there's a few questions. Yeah, so uh, take, we got a few uh, questions here. <laughs> take the share off, and uh, there we go. Cool. All right. All right. Awesome. Um, now, the first question we have here is, uh, good evening, Dr. Fava. Uh, I would like to know, what are the standards that your practice use uh, uses to evaluate an implant's quality from different companies? That's a very good question. So there's like 135 implant manufacturers. That's I crazy. Work with one. Oh now, I'm God. not saying that, the only one, that this is the only one you can use. I use Stroman implants. 
They're the most expensive ones. It just is what it is. The two most important parts of an implant is the implant surface and the implant connection. So the surface of the implant is literally what the, let's call it the coating, even though they don't really have coatings per se, but the outside surface, like we can all appreciate the outside surface of wood is different than, it is different than glass, right? So they treat, the implants are treated, almost every implant right now is, is sand, it's called SAE, sandblasted, acid etched, almost all of them to make them micro rough, to make a micro rough structure. Well, the amount of micro rough is varied between the implants. Um, but the surface is what the integration happens on. And that's like the biological interface. So me personally, I think that Strauman's surface is the best surface. It promotes the quickest bone growth and healing. So it's what works for me. So that's what I do because I do a lot of immediate implant placement, taking a tooth out, placing an implant at the same time. That's a very, very different process than a healed site, you know, coming to it, a, a site with no tooth, healed gum, healed bone, and you go place an implant. So my requirements are, are more strict in that way. My biggest, my, my, my biggest take on it, and this is again, personal. Let me just be very, very clear. This is personal. This is anecdotal is I stay away from implants that are quite honestly, I stay away from the cheaper implants. The reason for that is just because the amount of effort that can be put forth to their overall organization is just, is just lesser. So Strauman is a really great company. Strauman happens to be involved with the ITI group that I was, that I was telling you about. And uh, the other bit is that the connection is very important because the connection is the other area where there's a biological interface. When your crown sits into an implant, it's connected by that connection. And the amount of mobility in that connection, the amount of ability to resist uh, any rocking or rotation, and it's also its ability to kind of seal, so to speak, so that it doesn't, all, all the implants allow bacteria in, that's just the way that it is, but the way for it to better be sealed and be more stable is, is better. Lastly, as a surgeon, I don't have to worry as much about the prosthetic end but different implants have different types of abilities to be restored. So certain implants are more or less forgiving in terms of how you actually approach them. My general, my general guideline for implants is stick with the big name brands. The, the reason for this is because um, I, I personally believe that you can get the best support from them and you also don't have to worry about parts. So another thing is implants, they age. And when you have some of these weird implants from like these weird companies, you know, a, a crown breaks and you have to get parts for something. Ooh, man, that's one of those things I'm so glad I don't have to deal with because it's, it's hard because the great news is a company like Strauman, they'll never go out of business. They, they, they will always be in the implant business forever, which means that their entire line will always be able to be serviced. That's just how it is. You know, that's just, that's just how it is. So I, I personally stick with um, like big name brands um, and the ones that really that specialists tend to go for because you have more understanding of the research of, the, of their surface there is more independent research on their surface. There's more research and development into that and into their connection, um, so that they're so that they're they're I I believe they're the things that I'd put in my mouth. So that's what I do for my patients. Got that you. That was sense. an amazing response. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, it's it's really interesting because everyone talks about actually putting implants, but now you're looking at the quality of each implant and which ones you want to use. So. Um, that's really good advice. Thank you so much. No problem. Um, just for the sake of time, I think we'll go with one last question. Um, I see there's one person asking, 
What advice would you give someone in dental school that would help them set up for work and opportunity after graduation from dental school? So at the very outset, one of the things I was really talking about was like kind of networking, right? The, the idea of, of that. I think that it's really important no matter, I'm very passionate about perio, right? Perio and implants. It's, 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 a, it's a very, very big part of my life and it's, it's how I interface with, with my community. But, you know, I found good mentors at Penn. They have a really strong perio program. And so I got really good mentorship. And that didn't necessarily help me get to work per se, but that got me into something that I was passionate about. You will excel at things that you're passionate about. So, you know, listen, not everyone's going to be as passionate as dentistry as I am, meaning dentists, you know, like I, 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 I you know, may go be going overboard. But the point is that if you're finding something where it's really kind of your bag, you're going to naturally gravitate towards it and you'll naturally progress. Okay. So you, you'll naturally do that. I think that if you were like, as a pre-dental student, what I would do is I would, you know, you guys are doing this, this type of shadowing, what have you, what I would do is I would actually even go to dental conferences and you can get into dental conferences, um, you know, because you can see, you can see that. I think that, one bit you'll have to pay very close attention to, and this is not to speak completely ill because it's not all ill, but the thing you'll have to pay attention to is corporate dentistry is an enormous part of dentistry, okay? And so not all of them are bad, but a lot of them are chop shops. And what they do is they really look for effectively like a heartbeat in a seat and they're just churning through new grads and stuff like that. One technique that people have used is they've used it as a way to just gain experience, gain speed. And then with the full intention of being like, I'm going to work here for like three years and I'm out. I had a mentor who said this to me, and I remember to this day, and they said it to me in dental school, thankfully. He said to me, you better get good before you get fast, because if you get fast, you may never get good. And what he's really pointing out that may not be obvious to you guys because you're not in it just yet is you're going to see that when you're starting to do your first clinical stuff, your preclinical stuff, there's people who are going to naturally have hand skills and they're going to be able to move stuff around and manipulate the drill and the teeth and the wax and the stuff. And you're going to have someone who, you know, when you guys are doing your, your, your testing and stuff like that, you're going to see it. They're the first one done. Someone's going to finish first, right? And someone's going to finish last, right? This is how it works. I mean, just in time. And you'll see that there's some, a little click of people who are going to focus on the time thing. And some of those people who I mentioned earlier, who may just be focused on the money thing, there's going to be some people who will be like, I can do a crown prep in seven minutes. The idea is that being good, I still think outweighs that ability to be fast. And one of the things that you do not want to do when you're going into work is you do not want to come out as a new grad and have the pressure of having to be fast fast because you're not fast. And I came out of Penn. I did very well going into Penn. I did very well at Penn. And then I got to my residency and my program director made it very clear to me in the first two weeks that I was dangerous. And I was kind of floored to find out of this because I was like, whoa, I've been doing so good. Like what's, what's up? How? And then it was a real realization, real cold water in my face. And you're like, whoa, I've got, I don't know anything. You do not want to be in a spot where you're going to feel pressured. The bigger machines are going to pressure you. It's just the nature of the beast. They are looking to put as many people through those offices as much as they can. I would highly suggest that you only work at them part-time and be somewhere else part-time. You look for a good mentor. The place where you should work first the, the place you really should be trying to put your eggs into a basket 
should be a place where you're going to get mentorship. You need somebody who values dentistry and values humans in a one-to-one basis. It's not that all DSOs are bad. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that if they're nameless, faceless, the person who owns it is some group of suits and you'll never know who they are and never meet them. They're making decisions on how you perform care and they've never even been a dentist before. You are going to be in a position where you are going to learn bad skills and it is harder to unlearn bad skills than it is to slowly develop good skills. It takes time and you need somebody who's going to be patient Um, to give you guys an idea. You know, one of my associates is someone who practiced for many years and we were partners. So, you know, there's not much in the way of mentorship there. If anything, I was being mentored by him beforehand. Right. But I, one of my other associates is someone who actually came for me, came to me and they were older than me, but I have a real strong mentorship with, with this person. This person was coming from a, a, a DSO dental service organization, these, these big corporate things and his experience in how he was even just treated there versus how he's treated with me. Um, because I value the dentistry because I value our patient care, because I put our values before our values and our ethics before I put our business, it enables him to grow safely and to, in order to, to, uh, express himself in the way that he wants to express himself, learn the techniques he wants, do the, the, the challenge himself in the cases he wants and, you know, go for the level that he, that he's going for. You need something like that. I'm not talking about just me because I'm being egotistical. It's because that's what I had. I had the ability to say, Hey, listen, you're here now. This is your salary. You're not going to earn it at first because you don't, you can't it, unless you're really exceptional. And, and listen, that's not important, but you need someone who's going to support you. So if you go to dental conferences, you may be able to start meeting people and finding people that might be more like-minded. They're more education-based. They're more about their skill and what kind of value they're providing. And those are the things that I think are really, really important to be looking for because ultimately where you start has a huge impact on where you go. So I think that it's very, very important. So if you are going to work in a DSL, you may not have a warm, fuzzy feeling because you got to have a job, right? You got to have a job. Try your best to balance that with something where even if you're being somewhere part-time or you can kind of practice more ideally and get, just get mentorship. You need mentorship is what you need because coming out of dental school the, the plain reality, and it's not a bad thing because everyone deals with it, is you're not skilled enough yet. You're just not. You're going to get there. You've got the basics. You need someone who's going to bring you along and help you to get there. That's the most important thing. That will make you grow in your first five years more than any type of speed or, hey, look, I know how to do this cut corner dentistry that you'd get in the five years of doing a DSO. Where you would go, where your trajectory would go, you'd be very flat doing it the, the other way. Whereas you have a mentorship, yeah, you'll start slower, but where you'll go will be much, 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 much further. And that's, that's, and really that's why it's worth it. It's hard. Mm-hmm. Trust me, it's hard because you're going to see when you come into dental school because it's competitive, it can be challenging to get a job and afford the bills and all type of stuff because, you know, that stuff comes, it comes with time. So be ready to weather that storm because if you do that and you play your cards right and you're with the right person, you get that good mentorship, where you can go will far exceed it, but you will have offers from places. that will be like, Hey, here's your salary. This is where these are your hours. You don't got to worry about anything. You don't got to worry about right. You know, how to manage the team, how to manage the patients, where are you getting this from? Boom, like we, we've got it all for you. That's great. It is. But, but remember what you then miss in the long run. So just that's my biggest advice. Find mentorship 
And that comes from meeting people. You have to know who that human being is that you're working with or human beings that you're, that you're working with. You need the mentorship that will have the most profound impact on your, on your, on, on your, uh, on your uh, practice. And even if that means awesome. opening up by yourself, open up by yourself and go get involved with good specialists. Go get a good endodontist, good orthodontist, good periodontist, good oral surgeon, Go find them and find them who are going to say, hey, we can help you with cases. We can, we can, we can help teach you. It's best to have a GP if you're going to be in the GP thing, but get that type of mentorship. Find mentorship, and that will help you really set up for your future. Thank you so much, Dr. Fama. That was really great advice. And thank you for your informative presentation as well. We really appreciate your time. You're very well. Um, and everyone, we do have Dr. Fawa's Instagram posted on our Instagram. So if you guys want to give him a follow and thank you for joining us. And we all hope you have a great rest of your night. Yeah. Bye, and everyone. if you guys want to reach out to me through Instagram, super, I mean, like I, I have fielded hundreds of messages through Instagram. We found each other through Instagram. So yes, <laughs> it's um, Fresh Prince of Perio. It's a play yeah. on Philadelphia. We have it. Okay, good. All right. So we just have send it that out to everybody that you can do that.